Okay, in this lecture, we take a look at what is called a two-dimensional explosion. In this particular case, the problem that we'll look at, an object explodes into three pieces and it does so in the XY plane. As we'll see, we set this up in a similar manner to the one-dimensional explosion, but there are a couple of differences. First of all, this will be a two-dimensional case. And then secondly, instead of two objects, there will be three objects. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the problem, copy it down into your notes as I read it here. An object initially at rest on a horizontal frictionless surface explodes into three pieces. The first piece has a mass of one kilogram and a speed of one meter per second to the positive x direction after the explosion. Okay, I need to move my file. The second piece has a mass of two kilograms and a speed of two meters per second and a 45 degree angle with respect to the positive x direction after the explosion. We're going to take a look at a couple of things here. In part A of the problem, it asks, what is the velocity of the third piece if its mass is three kilograms? Essentially, what's being described here is a rather complicated looking diagram. So that looks like this. So right here is our two dimensional surface. It's flat and it's frictionless. And then we have our three objects like so, and then they explode apart. Now we're given that the first object, like so, moves along the x-axis with a velocity v1 final, the magnitude is one meter per second, and the mass m1 is given to us as one kilogram. Okay, and then the second object explodes off at a 45 degree angle, like so. So here's its mass m2, which is given as two kilograms, its speed, the magnitude of V2 final, is given to us as 2 meters per second. And then the angle that that vector makes with respect to the positive x-axis, like so, this angle here, theta, is given to us, that's equal to 45 degrees. Okay, and then we have the third piece, M3, which explodes off in some direction. Now, using a little bit of mathematical intuition, into which quadrant do you suppose the third piece explodes off into? Probably the third quadrant. Now, of course, we're going to have to verify that mathematically as, our, as we work our way through the example. But just to be able to picture things, let's say that the third piece does something like this, like so. So right here is M3, and then right here is V3 final. Okay, the uh, mass, rather, M3 is given to us as 3 kilograms, but we don't know the magnitude of V3 final, nor do we know its direction. Now, to describe the direction associated with this velocity vector, Let's go ahead and define an angle here in green on the diagram. Let's refer to this angle here as phi. Okay, and now we set up our conservation equation, but in this case it's two dimensional and there are three pieces. So our expression is as follows. Zero equals delta P1 plus delta P2 plus now delta P3 is equal to zero. We actually could set up this equation entirely in one shot using I hat and J hat notation. But in order to do so, it's initially a little bit confusing. So what we usually do <coughs> here at the introductory level is we break it up into the x and y directions. And then we look at those directions separately and then bring it all together at the end of the problem. So then here's the notation, first of all, for the x direction that you'll see. Okay, so I'm going to have delta P1 sub x plus delta P2 sub x plus delta P3 sub x is equal to zero. So we're just taking a look at the x direction. And then we have to do final minus initial, final momentum minus initial momentum of each object, but specifically in the x direction. Okay, so let's take a look at, first of all, object number one. Now, object number one explodes off into the positive x-axis by definition of the problem, so then therefore its final momentum in the x-direction is just simply m1 times v1 final. Okay, and then minus the initial momentum of number one in the x-direction, which is equal to zero, because object number one begins at rest. In fact, all of the objects begin at rest, not just in the x-direction, but also in the y-direction. So each of these terms, as we fill them out in the x-direction and then later on in the y-direction, are all going to have a minus zero associated with them because all of the objects begin at rest. Okay, now we have object number two. So its final momentum in the x-direction after the explosion is its mass, m2, multiplied then by the x component of v2 final. That's v2 final cosine theta. So then therefore, its final momentum in the x direction is m2 v2 final cosine theta. Then minus the initial, which is equal to zero, once again, 
because the object begins at rest. And now we have the unknown, M3. So M3's final momentum in the x direction is going to be M3, and then multiply by the x component of the unknown V3 final vector. That's going to be V3 final cosine of phi, the unknown angle. So then therefore we have M3, V3 final, cosine phi, and then minus the initial once again, which is zero, because all the objects begin at rest. And now the question is, is okay, well, what do I solve for? Do I solve for V3 final? Do I solve for cosine phi? Well, what I actually solve for is V3 final cosine phi. If I solve for V3 final cosine phi, what I'm solving for is the x component of the V3 final vector. And then in just a few moments, when we set this up in the y direction, basically all the cosines that you see behind me are all gonna turn into signs, and then we eventually solve for the y component of the V3 final vector. That's the basic process that we use here for part A of the problem. As I said earlier, we can do the entire problem in one shot, but it's a little bit easier if you break everything up as I'm doing here. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve for V3 final cosine phi. So to do so, take these two terms here and move them to the other side, they become negative when I do. Like so. And now the last step here, of course, is just to divide the M3 to the denominator on the other side. So let me do that like this. And now we just plug in our numbers. Now, if the V3 final vector is in the third quadrant, as we're guessing, then the X component should be a negative number. So let's see what happens. So in the numerator, first of all, I have negative one times one, so negative one, and then minus two times two times cosine of 45, so minus four times cosine of 45, and then all divided by three kilograms. And sure enough, I end up with a negative number. So this right here is negative 1.28 about meters per second, like so. Okay, and then we just do this process once again, but now in the y direction, here is then the notation that you're going to see. All right, so here's the x component from just a few moments ago. I'm going to write it over here so we can keep track of it. It's negative 1.28 meters per second. And now let's take a look at the y direction. Okay, first of all, the notation that you're going to see is going to be change in momentum of number one in the y direction, plus change in momentum of number two, plus change in momentum of number three is equal to zero. And now we just start filling in our terms. But what we do, final minus initial, now we're just looking at the y direction for each object. So first of all, for object number one, object number one, remember, exploded along the positive x-axis by definition. So then therefore, its final momentum in the y direction is equal to zero. Okay, then minus the initial, which is also zero, because once again, all of the objects begin at rest. And now I have the change in momentum of number two in the y direction. So object number two has a final momentum in the y direction that's equal to m2 and then multiplied by the y component of v2 final. That's a V2 final sine theta. That then looks like this. Minus the initial, which is zero, because once again, the object begins at rest. And now we get to the unknown, M3. So now the final momentum of M3 in the y direction is going to be M3 and then multiplied by the unknown y component of V3 final. That's V3 final cosine phi, or excuse me, times sine phi. There we go, like so. And then minus zero, because once again, the object begins at rest. And then what we solve for here is the y component of v3 final. We solve for v3 final sine phi. So to do so, we'll take this term here and move it to the other side. It becomes negative when we do. Like so. And now we divide by m3 to the other side to get v3 final by itself. So, and now if the V3 final vector is in fact into the third quadrant, this should also be a negative number. Okay, so numerator is negative two times two times sine of 45, so negative four times the sine of 45, and then all divided by three kilograms, and this works out to be negative 1.37 meters per second. So we have a negative X component and a negative Y component here to the V3 final vector, Therefore, the final velocity of the third piece is, in fact, in the third quadrant. Okay, so then, therefore, we would write the answer to part A in the following manner. In vector form, the V3 final is equal to negative 1.28 i hat and then minus 1.37 j hat. 
meters per second length cell as the final velocity of the third piece. It doesn't ask necessarily for the magnitude or the direction in this problem, so then therefore I can just leave it in vector form and that's perfectly fine. Okay, now a couple of things to follow up. I'm just checking my number here, by the way, for V3 final sine phi. And in fact, I did make a mistake from earlier. I thought that that didn't quite look correct. It's still a negative number, but it's negative 0.94 meters per second. So let's go ahead and change this up here. Let's make sure that we get rid of that mistake. There we go, like so. Okay, so this is in fact correct. Let me just double check. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. All right, at any rate, however, now that I've made that correction. A couple of other things to take a look at here briefly to follow up the problem. Let's now take a look at part B. I need to move my file. Okay, part B says, how much energy was released in the explosion? So here's then how we can begin to picture this. I'm gonna tilt my camera because I'm gonna demonstrate this by using, for example, my carts here on my desk. Okay, so I'm tilting my camera. There we go, like so. Okay, now the three objects that I'll use here for the problem are the two carts and this additional weight like so. And then we begin with the carts all crammed together in some manner. Ultimately, we have some form of spring potential energy associated with these elastic bands. And then what happens to that spring potential energy? Well, it's transformed into kinetic energy as the objects explode apart. So then therefore the amount of energy that was released in the explosion is equal to the sum total of the kinetic energies of all of the pieces after the explosion. So then therefore we could set up part B in the following way. The energy E that's released in the explosion is the kinetic energy of all the pieces added together after the explosion. So it's one half M1 V1 final squared plus one half M2 V2 final squared plus one half M3 V3 final squared like so. So I just have to plug in everything and then I end up with a certain amount of joules. Keep in mind, however, that kinetic energy is in terms of speed. So then therefore I do have to do a little bit of Pythagorean theorem with these components here to get the magnitude of V3 final. So let me go ahead and do that here really quickly before we plug everything in. So I now have 1.28 squared plus 0.94 squared. Take the square root of all of that. And I end up with a speed here of about 1.59 meters per second. So that's the speed that I need going in right here to calculate that kinetic energy. All right, now let's just go ahead and calculate these kinetic energies. So first of all, I have 1 half times 1 times 1 squared, so just a half. So plus one half times two, which cancels, times two squared, so plus four, and then this term here. So plus one half times three times 1.59 squared. And ultimately the amount of energy that's released here in the explosion is 8.3 joules like so. And then lastly in part C. In part C of the problem here, we're understanding why this truly is a two-dimensional explosion and not a three-dimensional explosion. Once again, I'll use my carts and my object here to demonstrate. Now let's say that by definition, when these three objects explode off of each other, the two carts by definition explode into the XY plane. So then therefore, is it possible after I release these objects for these guys to explode into the XY plane and this third object does something like this, where it has a Z component here to its final momentum? The answer to that question is no, and the reason for that is because this Z component to its final momentum is not being canceled out by a Z component associated with these guys here. So then therefore, if these two carts explode into the XY plane by definition, this also has to explode into the XY plane such that the sum total momenta of all the carts added together is always equal to zero. In other words, everything has to cancel out in the XY plane. So that's why this truly is a two-dimensional explosion and not a three-dimensional explosion. In order for a three-dimensional explosion to occur, an object has to explode into a minimum of four pieces. Are we gonna do such an explosion as a problem? Absolutely not, it's a horrible mess. So then therefore we conclude explosions with this example here 
as you've found in this video and the one that preceded it. Describing explosions in one and two dimensions is pretty straightforward.